Good morning all and thank you for joining us on today's webinar. I do hope that you're all keeping safe and well. First of all, before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. We are all still working remotely, so we do apologise in advance for any unplanned disturbances. You may notice a change of scenery. I'm back in the office today for the first time as it was just too noisy at home with the workmen. Um, but we are still having building work here. I have asked them to stop drilling for an hour, but I do apologise for any, any background noise. Just so that you know, you're all on mute and your cameras are switched off. So you can see us, but we can't see you. Um, there is the facility for you to ask questions as we go through today's presentation. So if you do want to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We will try and answer them on the webinar if time allows, but if not, we'll follow up after today's webinar with you. So don't worry, uh, we will get back to you. We've covered some really interesting topics so far on these sessions and the feedback has been excellent. If you have missed any of the previous webinars, the recordings are all on our new YouTube channel. So please do take a look on there and you can find us by searching for Oakmere Wealth. Now you may, may remember a few weeks ago, we sent out an email with a link to a survey asking what you, our clients, would like to see covered on our webinars. The overwhelming response was that you wanted to know more about wills and inheritance tax planning. So today's session is the first in this series. As we're all now aware, lockdown is about to be relaxed in England and the two metre rule is being eased. We have pubs, restaurants, cinemas about to reopen and the government daily briefings are coming to an end. And it's now finally time to get a haircut and move slowly and carefully towards some degree of normality. So what have we learned so far from this pandemic? Well, amongst other things, it's confirmed that for most people, health and wealth are two primary drivers. And although we can't always be in control of our health, we now understand that there are steps we can take not only to mitigate the risk of contracting the virus, but also with other serious health issues. Likewise, we can't always be in control of our wealth, but at least having an understanding of what wealth is and why it should be managed helps to reduce the possibility of future financial issues. And at the same time, it provides a degree of financial certainty. The importance of financial planning has also been reinforced. And this, is now, this has never been as more important than it is now, especially given the economic situation that we now face. We see an enormous diversity between the generations towards life and money, particularly in the face of very different life and financial challenges, and how a person manages their wealth is very heavily influenced by their age and experience. Financial goals will certainly change as we move through the various stages of our lives, but the one constant is that good planning is the key to successful wealth management and will almost certainly deliver positive outcomes. There's certainly a growing demand for generational wealth management, together with a desire to ensure that wealth is transferred in the most tax efficient way and managed effectively for future generations. Ensuring that a client's estate planning is up to date with current wills and power of attorney in place, as well as making sure that any trusts that have been established are still meeting their original objectives and are regularly reviewed by legal professionals is crucial. And it's a really key element of wealth management. So today, I'll just start her video. Um, Michelle, if you can just turn your camera on, please. We have Michelle Tong from JMW Solicitors joining us. Michelle's a trainee solicitor in the private client department at JMW Solicitors, which is one of the leading private client practices in the Northwest. She's been at the firm since 2017 and will qualify into the department in September. Michelle assists individuals and their families in all aspects of private client law, she advises on wills, trusts, inheritance, tax, probate, estate and succession planning. It does very nicely with what we do. Michelle's clients are from all walks of life and range from private individuals, including those with high net worth, through to business owners. So Michelle, over to you if you want to share your screen. Thank you. Morning, everybody. So I'll just get, share my screen. Bear with me one second. So I'd just like to start today by saying thank you so much for attending. I appreciate it is the hottest day of the year outside and I can imagine attending a will seminar wasn't the most exciting thing on your to-do list today. However, I do hope that you find the contents of today's webinar quite useful. So I am going to be talking today about wills and trusts and just why having an up-to-date will in place is so important. 
when I meet clients for the first time, often the first thing they say to me is, oh, I've been meaning to put a will in place for years, or it's something that we've intended to do, but we've just not got around to doing it. But I can't stress how important it is to have an up-to-date will in place, not only to ensure that your estate passes in accordance with your wishes, but what I don't think people realise is the wills themselves can actually offer a lot of tax planning and estate preservation opportunities. So before I go on to talk about wills in a little bit more detail, I'm just going to give a, a brief background about JMW solicitors. So JMW was established in 1978. We're based in Spinningfields in Manchester city centre, although we have recently opened an office in Liverpool and one in London. We're quite a large firm. We have 67 partners and nearly 500 staff, and we're hoping that that number is going to continue to grow. Our clients are from all walks of life and range from private individuals through to major and international companies. We're recognised by the Legal 500 and the Chambers Guide as one of the leading law firms in the Northwest. And that's across a range of practice areas. So for private client wills and estate planning, we're actually ranked tier one, which means we're one of the top five firms in the Northwest who, who deal with, with this area of law. So what do we do? I think we can summarise what we do in, in two words, and I think this is similar to, to what your financial advisors do for you, and it is to protect wealth. So in particular, when clients come to us for an initial meeting, the first thing that they tend to say is actually what we want to do is we want to protect our estate for future generations. And in order to do that, what we tend to advise on is wills and estate planning, tax planning, including inheritance tax planning, trust and trust law and also the incorporation of trusts within wills which is something that i'll go on to talk about in a little bit more detail and lasting powers of attorney documents which are if you were to lose mental capacity during your lifetime we also deal with probate so before i go on to talk about wills i thought it'd be useful just to cover some of the potential threats to a person's estate so often when people are putting wills in place all they tend to think about is oh who do i want my estate to pass to is that my grandchildren is it my children but what people should be thinking about and these are the conversations that you should be happy, having between each other is what are the potential threats to our uh, to an estate one of the main threats to an estate, and I'm sure this is something that you have heard of, is inheritance tax. Now, as Carla said, we are going to be doing a separate webinar which will cover inheritance tax and inheritance tax planning in more detail. But for the purposes of today, I thought it would be quite useful just to give an overview, because when you are looking at putting a will in place, it is something that should be considered. So inheritance tax is chargeable at 40% on death. However, it is not necessarily the entire estate that's taxed at that amount because there are some reliefs available from inheritance tax. One of the main reliefs that is available from inheritance tax is something called the nil rate band. And that currently stands at £325,000 per person. And that means that you're able to pass £325,000 to whoever you may like free of inheritance tax. Now that nil rate band is transferable between husband and wife or between spouses. So if you are a married couple, you have a total of £650,000 that you can pass free of tax to the next generation. In addition to the nil rate band, the government introduced something called the residence nil rate band in 2017. And that's currently worth £175,000, but it doesn't apply to everybody. So the residence nil rate band only applies if you own a main residence and you're going to be passing that main residence to direct descendants. Now that's children or grandchildren or, or stepchildren. So if you add the total figures of the nil rate band and the residence nil rate band together, this is where the government got this one million pound figure that you might have heard of to say, we will allow you to pass a million pounds to the next generation free of inheritance tax. But again, that is not necessarily the case because not everybody can claim those reliefs. And it's also dependent on how your wills are structured. Inheritance tax obviously is a major threat to the estate. On average, around £5 billion of inheritance tax is paid per year. And I thought I'd include this quote on the webinar. 
um, because I think it makes quite a good point. And, and it's a quote by Roy Jenkins, who's the former Chancellor of the Exchequer. And in 1986, he said that inheritance tax is a voluntary levy paid by those who distrust their heirs more than they distrust the inland revenue. Now, while I don't necessarily think that's true, I think it has a point to make in that inheritance tax with the right planning and, and with the right professional advice can be mitigated or even eliminated altogether. Another threat to the estate, which might not be thought about as much as inheritance tax, is the threat of care home fees. Now, care home fees can cost up to £50,000 per year, and, and in some cases, even more than that. If you have assets over £23,250, you are liable to pay for your own care. And that limit of £23,250 actually includes if you own a main residence. So as you can appreciate, if you own a property, then it is likely that you're going to be liable to pay for your own care if you were to end up in a care home. So that is another threat of, to the estate, which can be considered when looking at your wills. And again, I'll go on to discuss that throughout the webinar. Another threat to the estate, and, and I think in a way this is one of the most important ones, is vulnerable beneficiaries. Now, when I talk about vulnerable beneficiaries, I don't just necessarily mean somebody who isn't capable of managing their own affairs, although that is obviously an important consideration to have. But a vulnerable beneficiary is also somebody who is going through a divorce, somebody who is going through bankruptcy. And the reason they're vulnerable is that if at the time of death, they were to when they were to inherit it, they were going through divorce proceedings or bankruptcy proceedings, the estate could potentially be vulnerable. Again, something to consider is what if a beneficiary was to inherit at a young age or what if a beneficiary was frivolous with money? What if one of your chosen beneficiaries was in a relationship, relationship with somebody with an addictive personality? Who, would they convince them to spend the money on something that maybe you wouldn't approve of? And I think at this point, it's really worth mentioning that when you're looking at putting a will in place, you shouldn't just be reviewing the circumstances of your beneficiaries, but also with future generations. What if, for example, grandchildren are to inherit at a young age? So despite these threats to an estate, the harsh reality is that only seven out of 10 people have, sorry, seven out of 10 people do not have a will in place. And I'm not sure whether that's because people just don't get around to putting a will in place or if they just don't think it's that important, but it really can leave behind awful circumstances. And a recent case study that was actually in the news was a lady was married. She sadly passed away, but her husband was estranged and I don't think she'd seen him for 20 years. She had a child, but when she passed away, the estranged husband got wind of the fact that she had died and he made a claim against the estate. Under the intestacy rules, if you don't have a will in place, what they say is that the first £270,000 is to pass to the surviving spouse. And anything after that is split 50% between the spouse and 50% to children. Now, because the estate was under £270,000, sadly, the husband actually was successful in his claim and got the entire estate. And I'm sure you'll all agree that wouldn't have been her wishes. Another awful circumstance that we see quite a lot is in the event where a couple is married, and they both have children from a previous relationship. So where the stepchildren involved in the family. If one of the couple were to die and everything was to pass to the surviving spouse, and then that person was to pass away, the only people who would actually inherit under the intestacy rules are the second persons to die children, leaving the stepchildren with absolutely nothing and then leaving one side of the family without any inheritance tax. So, it is incredibly important, no matter what your circumstances, to put a will in place. But I think these are things that sometimes people don't think about. So we've established that it's really important to have a will in place. And what are our 10 top tips when looking at wills and estate planning? Top tip number one, although this might seem like an obvious one, is to choose your executors and trustees carefully. Now, your executors and trustees are the people who are, you appoint within your will to administer your estate. So they're the people who will be in charge of applying for a grant of probate, collecting in the assets of the estate and distributing them in accordance with your will. 
Now, why I say it's important to choose your executors and trustees carefully is because if you have a difficult executor, they can make life quite miserable for the beneficiaries. Uh, just as an example, I had a call from a lady a couple of weeks ago who was a sole beneficiary in a will, and the sole executor was the deceased brother, and the deceased person was her partner. He was making life very difficult for her in that he didn't want to do anything. He was trying to keep some of the money for himself. And to be honest, it's probably going to end up in a court application. When looking at appointing executors and trustees, your executors can be the same people as your beneficiaries, which I think is a common myth that you can't do that. But they don't necessarily have to be. You can appoint a minimum of one executor, but two if there's a trust in place within your will and a maximum of four and it's really important just to ensure that all of you executives and trustees actually get on and have a good relationship, not only with the beneficiaries, but also with each other. Because in order for a decision to be made, all executives have to act unanimously, meaning that they all have to agree. So if you do have a will in place at the moment, just have a look over your executives and trustees and see if you are happy with the appointment. Top tip number two is to express your funeral wishes clearly within your will. Now, it's not a legal requirement to express your funeral wishes within your will, and it's certainly not an invalid will if it doesn't have funeral wishes in it. But from experience, when I've been dealing with probate, I often find that where there are clear funeral wishes in the will, it gives the family a, a little bit of a peace of mind and a little bit of comfort knowing what their family's funeral wishes were. I think it's not a conversation that you often have openly with each other. People don't really like to talk about death and it's not something that you talk about over Sunday dinner. So it doesn't have to be specific. You don't have to go into a lot of detail about your funeral wishes and you will. It could simply be something as easy as, oh, I want to be cremated or I wish to be buried. But clients have actually gone into quite a lot of detail in the wills previously and I actually had a, a man a couple of years ago who said that if possible he wants his family to send his ashes to space in a rocket that's included in, within his will I don't know whether that will happen but at least his family are aware of those wishes top tip number three is to tell your executors and your family where your will is and again this might seem like an obvious point but you'd be surprised how many cases we have where the family come to us and they say, I know that my mum or dad had a will. They told me that they had one. I don't know where it is. And there's nothing amongst the papers to say where that will is kept. Now, without the original will, you actually can't apply for the grant of probate. And there's no central will registry necessarily in England. So even though somebody might have a will in place, if you can't find it, it's as good as not having one. What we recommend clients to do is to store the original will with the solicitors and then just have a copy of the document amongst their papers. And while I'm on that point, it's also quite useful just for, for ease of your family, really, to have a list of all of your assets. And, and if you have a financial advisor, obviously that list of assets might be with them. But just make sure that a list of absolutely everything is kept alongside a copy of your will. Top tip four is to consider the use of trust within your wills. Now, this is probably the most important point of the presentation, and it's one that I'm going to focus on the most. So trusts are an extremely useful tax planning and estate preservation tool. When people have what's called a basic will structure in place, what that means is that beneficiaries inherit outright. So a common example of a basic, simple will structure is everything passing between spouse in the first instance on the first death and then on the second death everything passing to children in equal shares. Now although there's nothing necessarily wrong with that and it's actually tax efficient because of the inheritance tax rules it doesn't provide any protection for the chosen beneficiaries and it doesn't provide any estate planning options within them. For example, when I was talking about vulnerable beneficiaries before, what if one of the beneficiaries were going through a divorce at the time of inheriting? Or what if one of them were going through bankruptcy proceedings? What if a beneficiary was entitled to means-tested benefits? What if a beneficiary was too young to inherit? At that point, it would have been extremely useful to have had a trust in place within the wills. Now, how trusts work is that they are one step removed from personal ownership. There's three elements to a trust. You have the trustees who are in control of the, 
trust and that comes back to the point why it's extremely important to make sure you're happy with your choice of trustees. The second part of a trust is the beneficiaries and they're the people that you name who you'd want to inherit under your will. So often that is children and grandchildren and your own bloodline. The third, the third part of a trust is the trust fund and that just compromises, that comprises of all the assets that you own at the date of death. Now a trust doesn't have to be retained once you've passed away. It can be closed down if the beneficiaries wish and the assets distributed in accordance with the will. However, by providing for your estate to be held within a trust, it really gives your beneficiaries the opportunity to sit down at the time of your death along with your trustees and just consider everybody's individual circumstances. For example, if one of the beneficiaries is going through a divorce, they might actually say, let's keep my share of the estate within the trust structure until it's safe to distribute. Whereas the other two beneficiaries might be happy just to have their estate distributed to them outright. So, so the key point is really that it provides your chosen beneficiaries with flexibility and with estate planning options. Trusts are also incredibly useful from an inheritance tax point of view. So trusts are capable of lasting up to 125 years. This is useful. So if your children, for example, were wealthy in their own right at the time of at the time of your death and inheriting your estate would actually take them above the inheritance tax threshold, they might have children of their own and decide to keep some of the funds within the family trust for the benefit of their children. And this is how trust can be extremely tax efficient across generations as then those funds would not form part of the children's estate for the purposes of inheritance tax. Another time that people want to incorporate trust within the wills is in the instance of second marriages and stepchildren. So when I give that example before of when there are stepchildren in the relationship and they might not end up with anything, a way of protecting against that is by incorporating a trust on the first of a couple to pass away. So how that would work in practice is that on the death of the first spouse, everything would pass into a trust structure. The surviving spouse would be a primary beneficiary of that trust and would have a right to live in any property. They would have a right to any income for the rest of their life. However, that underlying capital of the estate is preserved for the children because it's held within that trust structure. So there are a lot of reasons that you would put a trust in place and, and we do tend to recommend them to every single client because although right now you might think, oh, well, I don't really know if I need a trust within my will, death happens at an arbitrary moment in time and you don't know what your family circumstances are going to be. So by something as simple as putting a trust within your will, you can provide and, and preserve the estate for future generations. Top tip number five is to think about the cost of future care and how this might impact your estate. So before I mentioned that care home fees can be in excess of £50,000 a year. And as you will appreciate, that means that the estate could easily deplete over time. There is lifetime planning that you can do in relation to care home fees, such as transferring the main residence into a property within your lifetime. However, there are some tax considerations to have about that kind of method. And also the downside is that you no longer own your own home because it's held within a trust. So one option that we do offer clients and it's something that we ask clients to think about is incorporating trust within the wills on the first death to protect against the cost of care. How that works is on the first death of a married couple, the half of the estate would pass into the trust. The surviving spouse would have a right of residence again in the property and have a right to any income from the trust structure. But if that surviving spouse was to then end up in a care home, when the local authority do their financial assessment, they can't take into account the assets that have already passed into the trust structure. So it's a really clever way of protecting at least half of the estate from care home fees without actually having to do anything in your lifetime. So tip number six is to think carefully about vulnerable beneficiaries. And I know I keep going back to this point of vulnerable beneficiaries, but by doing something as simple as putting a trust within your will, you can protect against a lot of circumstances. So again, what if somebody isn't capable of managing their own funds? Your, if you incorporate a trust within your will, you make alongside your will something called a letter of wishes. 
and that is guidance for your trustees as to how to administer your, administer your estate. So if you had a vulnerable beneficiary who you think was too young, and I don't necessarily mean somebody who's 16, it could potentially be someone in the 20s, somebody about to go to university, you might say to your trustees in your letter of wishes, please drip feed the funds to the beneficiaries to see how they cope with the responsibility. If at 25 you think they're capable of managing funds on their own, then please distribute the funds to them and close the trust. However, it is, if somebody is incapable of, of looking after their own money, then it is important to put a trust in place. Tip number seven is to carefully consider the residence nil rate band rules. I talked briefly about the residence nil rate band rules earlier. So just to recap, that is an inheritance tax relief, which applies where you own a main residence and that main residence is to pass to children or grandchildren. The residence nil rate band is currently worth £175,000 per person. That's transferable between spouses, so it could be a total of £350,000. The reason I say that you when you're making a will, you should carefully consider the residence nil rate band rules is because the law was only introduced in 2017, a lot of wills before this date actually negate the availability of the residence nil rate band. So just as an example, when trusts are incorporated within wills, especially on the first death, because the main property might pass into the trust rather than directly to descendants, this could mean that the residence nil rate band rules aren't able to be claimed. Now, if you have a total relief of £350,000 that you can't claim, tax that at 40%, that's £140,000 of extra tax that the family might have to pay just because the will wasn't reviewed. Tip number eight is that businesses and widows or widowers can actually save thousands of pounds of additional inheritance tax. So I'll start talking just briefly about businesses. Businesses can potentially benefit from something called business property relief. And again, I will go on to talk about business property relief in the inheritance tax seminar on the 30th of July. However, just touching on it briefly, you may be able to qualify for business property relief if you have a business. That business has been owned for a period of two years. It's a trading business and there is no contract for sale in place at the date of death. Now, the reason I bring business property relief up when talking about wills is because planning can actually be done within the wills themselves to capture that business property relief. And that's done by way of a business property relief trust. What that business property relief does is that as at the date of death, it captures any assets that qualify for that relief. And it just ensures that going forward throughout future generations, the family can continue to benefit from that inheritance tax relief on the business, even if the business is sold. Moving on to widows and widowers, they can also save thousands of pounds of additional inheritance tax. So what I think a lot of clients don't know is that if you are to pass away, but your spouse has died before you, you can actually transfer all of their unused nil rate band and residence nil rate band. But not only that, if you have actually been married twice, you can claim double the relief. So if you were married and sadly your husband passed away, you remarried a few years later and sadly that husband also passed away, you can actually claim a total of one and a half million potentially in inheritance tax relief. Top tip nine is to plan ahead and review your will every three to five years. So for every single one of our clients, we always recommend that they should review their circumstances after this time frame. There's a couple of reasons for this. So the first is people's circumstances naturally do change over time. So it might be that there's been a, a new marriage in the family or sadly there's been a bereavement or there might be a new grandchild. So just have a look over your will every couple of years just to see if, if your wishes are still the same. Another reason and perhaps a more important reason is that the legislation changes and especially with inheritance tax they do tend to review that every few years the government and it could potentially be that although your will was tax efficient five years ago it's no longer the case now and that's also when I was talking about the residence nil rate ban before that's a really good example of how your will might no longer be tax efficient. 
Top tip 10 is, and the final point is to ensure that your will is executed correctly. And again, I know that this might seem like a final, uh, quite an obvious point, but with wills, we see a lot in practice that haven't been signed and witnessed correctly. And it might be that the will's been signed, but actually it's been witnessed by one of the beneficiaries. All that a will needs to do is to be legally binding is it needs to be signed and it needs to be signed in the presence of two independent witnesses. And an independent witness can be anybody who's not named in the will, who's over the age of 18 and who has mental capacity. So that is my overall discussion about wills. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. But what I'm also going to just briefly touch upon is lasting powers of attorney. They are equally as important to wills, I would say. So where a will deals with your assets and what is to happen to your assets if you were to pass away, lasting power of attorney documents are in relation to if you were to lose mental capacity during your lifetime. There are two types of lasting power of attorney documents. The first is in relation to property and financial affairs. And that allows you to appoint an attorney to act on your behalf in relation to your bank accounts and property if you are no longer in a position to do so. An example that I thought I'd just go through so you can see how important these documents are is we had a client recently who was sadly diagnosed with a brain tumor in his 40s. And he was quite a wealthy man and he had a business worth a few million pounds. When he was diagnosed with the brain tumor, he actually had a business sale that was in the process of going through. But before he was able to sign on the dotted line, sadly he did lose mental capacity and his family weren't able to step into his shoes to carry on with the business deal because he didn't have a lasting power of attorney document in place. Even if you do have a lasting power of attorney, attorney document in place, just worth reviewing them because it's quite important that there is some wording in there in relation to discretionary fund managers. So what this wording allows is if you were to lose mental capacity, it allows your financial advisor to keep on investing your funds on your behalf. And without this specific wording in the document themselves, your attorneys can't delegate that function to the financial advisor. The second document that you should be considering for lasting power of, of attorneys is a lasting power of attorney for health and welfare. And this does exactly what it says in that it allows your attorneys to make decisions in relation to your health if you are no longer in a position to do so. Just an example on this one of when they come into to use in practice is we had a case where a husband was sadly sent to an alternative care home by the social worker. And that was against his family's wishes. And the family were actually quite happy with the care home that he was in at the moment, at the time. But whether that was due to fees that they wanted to move him, I'm not too sure. But they end, ended up making an argument to say that he, it was in his best interest to move, even though that was against the family's wishes. A lot of people want to put health and welfare documents in place because it allows you to appoint your family to make decisions in relation to life sustaining treatment. Again, if you have lost capacity, capacity and can't make that decision for yourself. So even though the doctors obviously have to act in your best interest, this sometimes does mean, this sometimes does mean keeping people alive by artificial means, such as tube feeding and life sustaining treatment. A lot of clients really do feel quite strongly about this and would rather the family be making those decisions than the doctors. So at JMW, we're happy to give everyone a peace of mind and we do offer a free will, wills and estate review service. So we don't only look at the wills, but also any lasting power of attorney documents in place. And we also just review your inheritance tax position, as I think it's important to look at that alongside the wills, as, as I've explained in, in this webinar, they are actually, they do actually coincide. So please feel free to get in touch. I have put my email and also my direct dial on the slide. And I think it's just worth mentioning at this point that if we do have a meeting with a client, what we advise to do is have a collaborative approach with your professional advisors. So your financial advisors or your accountants, because we find when we offer that joined up approach, it's really effective in ensuring that the estate is protected for future generations and just ensuring that any inheritance tax liability is reduced. Thank you. Any questions, Carla?
Brilliant, Michelle. Thank you very much. That was really, really great. Um, we've got a question here. Um, how are people going about signing wills uh, in the current climate? Obviously, we had difficulties initially when, when lockdown happened, but is it still a problem for people now getting wills signed and documents like that? It's got a bit easier, but it's certainly still a problem. So when the lockdown first came out and we weren't even really allowed to leave our houses apart from exercise, Unfortunately, the law didn't keep up to date with that. And I think the government had other things on the mind. So what we have had to be advising clients to do is to either sign the document through a window with a witness. So sign the document themselves, wave the, the window to your neighbours and post it through the letterbox. It's got a little bit easier now in that you can see up to, is it up to six people. I've lost track of the rules, to be honest. Um, but what the people can do now is go in other people's gardens. And as long as you're having a two metre distance from each other, then you, you, that should be absolutely fine. Brilliant, thank you for that. Um, one of the tips that you mentioned there, Michelle, um, I think it was tip three, just about letting your family know. Um, mm -hmm. This is something that families seem to find it quite difficult to talk about wealth and about you know intergenerational planning. It's something we, we come across all the time and are trying to engage with younger generations. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was, was say, letting people know where the documents are. We actually have a document which we call My Documents, which we can use with clients, mm. where we just capture every single asset that, we, that we've got. We can put details of where the will's held, how it's returning, things like that. So that's really useful. Really useful. yourself, if we've got all the assets there as well, it's useful for yeah. you drafting the wills. Definitely. And we do find that when people have financial advisors, everything is a lot more organized because it's part of the process that you do go through with your financial advisor. So then it is OK. But when people don't have financial advisors, it can be a bit more difficult if they've never given anybody that information. Yeah. Yeah. So if anybody on the call wants to know more about that, about the My Documents uh, document that we have available, do just, just get in touch with us. Um, so thank you, Michelle. Uh, obviously, the West, next webinar we're planning will be uh, 30th of July, and that's on inheritance tax planning. So we'll be having you back on again then. So that's great. Um, just for everybody on the call on the webinar, there is a poll at the end of the session today. So when you come to leave the webinar, um, there'll be three very quick questions, just finding out a bit more about how, you, how you've enjoyed today, if there's anything we could do better and things like that. Um, there will be an invite coming out for the next webinar very soon. It's also on our events page on our website. So please do keep an eye out for that. Um, oh, the poll's just come up now, I think. So if you want, anybody wants to, to vote on that, that would be great. Um, so the, the link to the next webinar is going to be coming out shortly. So again, pass it on to any friends or family that you might feel will benefit from that. If you have any questions that you want to put to us in advance of the webinar, please do get in touch. Send those to us in advance. We can make sure we cover them. Um, and again, just to remind you, it is business as usual here. As you can see, I'm back in the office. We are coming in sporadically now. We don't plan to be back in here full time until probably September time. But we're able to do all meetings by video or phone. So do get in touch. I know, Michelle, you're working remotely as well and able to carry everything out uh, yep. on video conferencing. Same. Business um, as usual, and a lot of paperwork yeah. can be signed electronically as well. So, you know, yeah, do just get in touch with us. Uh, and we're all delighted to have a chat with you at any time. So finally, just want to say thank you, Michelle, for giving us your time today. It's much appreciated. I know you're very, very busy. Pleasure. Um, and to everybody on the, on the session today, thank you for joining and please stay safe. Thank you.